Hello and welcome to Bite Size Law. I'm Amanda and I'm a private tutor in land law. In this video, I will take you through my answer to a problem question on co-ownership using the IRAC method. If you haven't come across IRAC before, it stands for Issue, Rule, Application and Conclusion and it's a really good technique to use when answering problem style questions. I put a brief explanation of how to use IRAC on the slide, but there is a full explanation of the technique in the notes of this video. I've also put a copy of the question that we're going to look at here too. So the question begins by telling us the initial owners of the property, and as the facts of the question unfold, various things happen which may have affected the ownership. What you are required to do is to work out who the present owners are and whether they can force the sale of the property. So, as you will discover, Michael and Grace are claiming to be the current owners. And essentially, there are two main parts to the question. In the first part, you have to work out how ownership of the land has changed. And in the second part, you need to consider how disputes between co-owners can be resolved. In other words, who can apply to court if co-owners disagree about selling the property and whether the court is likely to order a sale. So here are the facts explaining the circumstances surrounding the original purchase of the property. And the facts I would pick out are that they didn't contribute equally to the purchase price, that they were expressed to be beneficial joint tenants in equity, and that the four purchasers were all registered as proprietors at the land registry. So the first thing I would do is to explain that the land is co-owned because the four owners all had rights in the property which they enjoyed concurrently. I would also explain the relevant law which explains that a trust is imposed on co-owned land so the legal owners, who are the trustees, hold the land on trust for the benefit of the beneficial owners in equity. And it's very easy to overlook this first point in your answer, as the temptation is to jump straight in and look at how subsequent events affected the ownership. But this part is easy, and so marks are there right for the taking. Co-ownership questions are very popular with students in exams, so you need to ensure that your answer is as detailed and accurate as possible to distinguish it from other students' answers. So I would identify... Tommy, Arthur, Polly and Esme as the original legal owners because the facts state that they were named as the registered proprietors and because they all contributed towards the purchase price I would also conclude that they were the beneficial owners too. So my conclusion is that the original purchasers were holding the property on trust for themselves. I would then explain that there are two different types of co-ownership, a joint tenancy and a tenancy in common. And the issue now is which type of co-ownership is this? The four unities are present and I would briefly explain what these mean. And that means that potentially it could be either a joint tenancy or a tenancy in common. Now I always deal with the legal title first because the answer is always going to be the same. The relevant rule is in section 1 of the Law of Property Act 1925, which states that the legal owners can only ever be joint tenants. However, this rule doesn't apply to the equitable title. So the issue now is which one is it in equity? I would find the relevant rule which I can apply to the facts, and here... It is that any express statement in the original conveyance regarding the beneficial ownership is conclusive. And if we apply this rule, we can see that there was an express statement which confirms that the original owners were joint tenants in equity. So quite simply, if you see anything in the question which states that they were beneficial joint tenants in equity, then they are. So the conclusion is that they were joint tenants in equity too. I would also very briefly mention that the unequal contribution to the purchase price has no effect on the beneficial ownership here 
because the express statement takes priority. And here's a tip. If you're faced with a problem question on co-ownership, it's very common for examiners to want to test your understanding of how ownership can change through the process of severance of a joint tenancy. And severance is only ever relevant where there is a joint tenancy. It doesn't apply to a tenancy in common. So questions which require you to look at possible severances will usually involve an initial joint tenancy in equity. And in this particular question, it was very obvious from the facts that there were possible severances which needed to be considered. So it was very unlikely that it was ever going to be a tenancy in common in equity. So if you believe that the question involves a tenancy in common, just go back and check your reasoning carefully to make sure that you're confident that that is the correct decision. Now, although you should avoid long explanations of the law in your introduction to an answer, and examiners can spot a learnt generic introduction a mile off, I do think that it helps to briefly explain the distinction between a joint tenancy and a tenancy in common here. And this is because it's going to be relevant at several different points in my answer. It is, however, perfectly acceptable to wait until you have the first possible severance or death before you do this. I leave that up to you. So I would explain that the distinction is important because in a joint tenancy, the owners are not seen as owning a separate share in the land, but that they all own it together. And so when one joint tenant dies, ownership of the land passes automatically to the survivors. Whereas in a tenancy in common, each owner is regarded as having a separate share, which will pass on their death to the beneficiaries of their estate. So a tenant in common can leave their share of the land to whoever they choose in their will. I would also very briefly introduce the concept of severance at this stage by explaining that a joint tenant can convert their equitable joint tenancy into a tenancy in common by a process known as severance. However, I wouldn't explain the different methods of severance at this stage. For this, I'd wait until a possible severance occurs and then select the most relevant method to the facts. So now I'd explain that in order to advise Michael and Grace, I need to consider how the subsequent events affected ownership of the land. And here are just some tips for you. First of all, you must always work it out in chronological order. Secondly, always plan your work and work out how the ownership changes right up until the end before you start to write up your answer. I have seen lots of exam papers where students have suddenly realised that they made a mistake earlier in their answer and have had, had to delete long sections. It doesn't do much for your confidence if you have to do this, so work it out and check it again. And finally, if you end up with truly horrendous fractions, check to see if you've made an error somewhere. Examiners don't expect you to be wonderful mathematicians, so the math should be reasonably basic. Although, if you can't do fractions, this probably isn't a topic for you to choose to answer a question on in the exam, if you have a choice. The first major event to happen is that Tommy moves out of the property. And the issue is whether when a co-owner moves out of a property, does this have any effect on the ownership? In other words, could it act as a severance? And I would explain that the common law in Williams and Hensman confirms that a co-owner can sever his joint tenancy unilaterally by acting on their share of the land. In other words, you do something to separate your share of the property and that would act as a severance but it must be something which shows an intention to change the ownership of the property. When we come to apply this, well, moving out of the property on its own isn't sufficient to indicate that Tommy intended to change the ownership. So I would conclude that there was no severance in January 2015. The next thing to happen is that Tommy writes to all the other co-owners and we're told what he writes in the letter.
We're also told that the letter was delivered to the property, but unfortunately Arthur destroyed it without reading it. And the main issue here is whether the letter acted as a severance of the joint tenancy. In terms of the relevant law, section 36 subsection 2 confirms that a written notice to all of the joint tenants can operate to sever a joint tenancy. So if we apply that, Tommy's letter is in writing and addressed to all the remaining joint tenants. So we can conclude that potentially the letter was a valid notice of severance. The next issue we have to consider is whether the wording of the letter is sufficient. So the rule is that there's no particular form of wording that needs to be used, but it must show an immediate and unequivocal intention to sever. So when we come to apply that to the relevant facts, we need to identify the relevant wording from the letter. And we can see that Tommy wrote that it was a severance of his share and also that he is now a tenant in common with them. So his share of the house would pass to Grace if anything happened to him. It's fairly safe to conclude that the letter did show an unequivocal and immediate intention to sever. You could also add in that as he sought the advice of a retired solicitor, the notice is likely to be worded effectively. The next issue relates to the giving of the notice to the other joint tenants. Can a notice be given to joint tenants even if it hasn't been read by any of them? And the case here is Kinch and Bullard. And in this case, the court decided that so long as the notice has been delivered or served, as it's called, in accordance with section 196 of the Lord Property Act, then the notice has been given, even if it's destroyed or intercepted before the other joint tenants have actually read it. So we need to check to see if indeed the letter was served in accordance with section 196 and where it's been either hand delivered or sent in the ordinary post, subsection 3 confirms that the notice is served if it is left at the last known address of the person to be served. So if we apply that rule to the facts, well the notice had been served because we know that it was sent to the last known address of all the other joint tenants and Arthur destroyed it after it had been delivered. So we can conclude that written notice was given to all the other joint tenants, which allows us to reach a final conclusion on this point that Tommy's letter was an effective severance of his joint tenancy. And incidentally, just in case you feel that the decision in Kinch and Bullard was harsh, in the case, the party who intercepted the notice was the party who would benefit from there not being a severance. So the person who sent the notice was the same person who intercepted it, and they would benefit from the right of survivorship. And this factor did weigh heavily on the court's decision in the case. And when I was marking students' answers to this question, I was very impressed to see that a few students were able to suggest that this might possibly be a distinguishing feature which was considered in the case. And it showed that these students had read the relevant case extract carefully and that they were able to apply it to the facts of this question. And at this point, I would now explain in more detail the effect of severance on the owner's ownership of the land. So the relevant rules are that severance only occurs in equity and that it only operates on that particular joint tenant's interest to convert their joint tenancy into a tenancy in common. In other words, the other co-owners remain as joint tenants. And the joint tenant who severs is entitled to a share of the land proportionate to the total number of joint tenants in equity. So because there were four joint tenants, Tommy will have a one-quarter share of the land. 
Now what I've done on this slide is to show you how I've applied these rules. This is how I work out how ownership changes. So this would form part of my rough notes. And I deal with the legal title first, which is on the left hand side. And the equitable ownership I divide into joint tenants and tenants in common. So we start with the initial ownership, which I've already explained that Tommy, Arthur, Polly and Esme were joint tenants of the legal estate. And we also know that they were joint tenants in equity too. And now we have the effect of Tommy's severance. Well, the legal title is unaffected because you can't sever the legal estate. Severance only operates in equity and he becomes a tenant in common equity and his share is proportionate to the total number of joint tenants. So because there were four of them, he became a tenant in common of a one quarter share. And remember that severance only affects Tommy's share. So the other three continue to own as joint tenants in equity of the remaining three quarters share.